It was early morning when Richard took his dog Baxter for a walk. They walked along the edge of the forest, among ancient pines and fresh grass covered in dew. The dog got a little wet, but it didn't stop him from enjoying another cheerful walk with his owner. Soon they reached a stream which murmured quietly and shimmered in the light. Richard was feeling a bit tired, so he decided to sit on the nearest boulder. Contemplating the beauty of the morning nature, he involuntarily recalled the past years. He was already 70. Not that he had aged drastically by this time, but time had taken its toll and he had become less mobile and energetic. He lived in his house on the edge of the forest, which he acquired after his wife's death. She had been gone for about five years now and her absence had a strong impact on him. Loneliness had gripped his soul, sometimes suffocating him to the point of being unbearable. That's when Sarah, his elder daughter, bought him a puppy. Taking care of the animal gradually began to dispel the melancholy, and over time, Richard found it easier. As he watched the running stream, he remembered walking in a similar place with his wife once, and a solitary tear rolled down his face. Interrupting his thoughts, he heard the dog bark. The dog ran around as if asking to continue the journey. Sorry, Baxter, I'm getting up, the old man said, getting up and continuing along the trail. The walk didn't last long. Richard decided to return earlier and prepare a festive lunch. Today was his late wife's birthday, and he wanted to mark the occasion. When he opened the gate, he realized it wasn't locked. Someone had come to him, probably Michael or Sarah. Only they knew he kept the keys under the geranium pot. He lifted it and made sure the keys weren't there. Then he walked into the house without concern. Opening the front door, which was also unlocked, he walked into the kitchen where he found a man around 35 years old of short stature, skinny with black hair. It was his son, Michael. He was leaning into the open refrigerator door, searching for something inside. When he saw his father, he straightened up and instead of greeting him said, Damn old man, your fridge is empty again. What do you even eat? Richard sighed tiredly and walked past him sitting on a chair. There's bacon in the cupboard, you can take it, he said. Great, Michael said, leaning down, he opened the cupboard door, took out a plate of bacon, and after popping a piece into his mouth, sat on a chair opposite and said, How have you been? It's been a while since I was here. Baxter misses you, but here he is, by the way. Michael beckoned the dog and threw him a piece of bacon. I see everything's fine with you whereas things aren't going so well for me. At this point, Richard looked at his son and pondered where he had gone wrong. They raised two children. Although their family wasn't wealthy, they managed to provide both with a university education. The elder, his pride, graduated with honors, then got a good job, got married, and had two children. The younger one, however, dropped out of school and associating with the wrong people, got involved in shady dealings. They and his wife always hoped he would mature and straighten out, but it never happened. Michael constantly got himself into trouble. Perhaps this partly contributed to his wife's death. She loved her son and constantly worried about him. Their savings went into paying off his debts, and one day she left them unable to bear the pressure. Then Richard cut off all ties with his son and after selling their large house in the city, moved to this secluded place. But the estrangement didn't last long. One day Michael came to him, apologized and promised to do better. He got a job at a car repair shop in town and seemingly stopped associating with those bad guys. Richard forgave him as he loved his son. Perhaps their excessive love with his wife had ruined him. 
they should have been stricter with him in his childhood. Also, he was constantly absent at work and didn't pay attention to his son. So Richard partly blamed himself for what had happened. Here's the thing, I need your help, Michael said. Seeing his father's displeased face, he quickly added, No, I don't need money. Then what do you want? Richard asked in surprise. After he asked the question, Michael pulled out his smartphone from his pocket, opened the local news website, and handed it to his father. Richard squinted, trying to understand what it was, then stood up, went to the cupboard, took out his glasses, put them on, and slowly sat back down to read. Here's what was written there. On Tuesday, a young couple went for a walk in the woods, where, according to their words, they encountered a mystical creature known as a Wendigo. They miraculously escaped, barely managing to flee. Currently, the frightened couple is in the hospital undergoing treatment, including psychological assistance. After this incident, there were disputes online about the truthfulness of their words and the existence of supernatural beings. The heated debates were fueled by a local millionaire who announced that he would give a million dollars to anyone who brings video or photo evidence of this creature. As a sign of his seriousness, he created a special account, which he handed over to the local authorities. This announcement caused a stir among local enthusiasts who rushed into the forest in huge crowds. We hope to learn soon whether the Wendigo really exists or if it's just the imagination of cryptozoologists. Reading the article, Richard nodded. This doesn't bode well, he thought. He looked up at his son and asked, So what do you want? Didn't you understand? Asked the son. You spent your whole life as a ranger in this forest. Remember, you told me once that you encountered this creature. Why don't we go there and take a photo? Then we'll become rich. It's a chance of a lifetime. After his words, Richard remembered that day. They and his partner were patrolling the area when they felt a chill in the middle of the summer day. What happened next often haunted him like nightmares. They barely survived then and never ventured into that part of the forest again. These memories sent shivers down his spine and he became angry with his son. Taking the nearby cane, he began to strike him with it, saying, Idiot, do you think this is a joke? This is really dangerous. If you came here for such nonsense, you better leave. I thought you remembered your mother's birthday, but you've come up with some nonsense again. Michael tried to defend himself from the blows trying to calm his father down and howling in pain with each hit. Soon they reached the exit when he cried out, Stop. I'm not asking this just for myself. I was recently at Sarah's and she's having big problems now. Something happened to her husband. I'm telling you the truth. Stop. Ow. Richard pushed his son out the door, saying that Sarah was already grown up and could handle it herself. Then he slammed the door, locking it. Michael's moans could still be heard on the doorstep, but soon he left, not getting what he wanted. Though Richard was angry, he was worried about the news about Sarah. She was his favorite and never caused any trouble. What happened to her, he thought. He took out his phone and called her. She didn't answer immediately. Her voice sounded tired, which worried her father. He asked how she was and requested her to come over. She said everything was fine reluctantly and agreed reluctantly to visit him. She came the next day. She brought her children with her. Jonathan and Emily were 10 and 7 years old, respectively. When they saw their grandfather, they ran up to him happily and hugged him. Richard loved his grandchildren and often spoiled them. After kissing the children, he hugged Sarah, who had a big belly. She was expecting her third child. He noticed her tired and worried face. 
Leaving the children to play with the dog, they went to the kitchen where Richard began to inquire about what had happened to his daughter. Sarah didn't want to worry her father, but she finally gave in. It turned out that her husband's company went bankrupt, and he's dealing with lawsuits and other problems. She can't go to work because of her pregnancy, and all this piled up on them at once. Richard silently listened to her, pondering something. Then the children rushed in, interrupting their conversation. After spending half a day with her father, Sarah and the children left him. He stood on the porch, watching them leave and waved goodbye to the children. When the car disappeared around the corner, Richard continued to stand there. He watched the beautiful sunset and pondered something. An hour passed. His face showed that he had made a decision. He entered the house and dialed his son's number. A disgruntled voice sounded on the other end. Richard only said a few words. That he agreed and that Michael should be with him in the morning. He didn't listen to his son's joyful shouts. It just hung up. Then he went to the chest of drawers where their family photo was kept. It showed his wife and children when they were still young. Looking at the photo, a warm smile appeared on Richard's face. He remembered the times when he was happy. Early in the morning, he started his old pickup truck and headed to town. The journey took half an hour. The first thing he did was go to the hunting store. He hadn't been out anywhere for a long time, so he needed things for the trip. There he was greeted by a 45-year-old man dressed in denim overalls and a red shirt. It was Jeremy Stronghold, his old acquaintance, who was surprised to see the old man. Hey, Richard, what brought you here? He said, shaking his hand. Hey, there's something I need to do. For that, I need a couple of things. Richard handed the list to the salesman, who turned it over, scratching his chin. As for the flamethrower, I'm not sure. There might be some left in the warehouse. He went out the back door and soon returned with the necessary items. There were a first aid kit, a camping pot, a machete, a flashlight. The salesman also pulled out a flamethrower, saying that luckily there was one left. It was a small device with a fuel tank. It could easily fit into a backpack. After that, Richard picked up a rifle. Jeremy looked at him suspiciously, squinting, and when he received the payment, he asked, Listen, Richard, aren't you going to the forest for that creature? You spent your whole life in it. You must know its secrets. For such money, even such an old wreck like you can take action. The old man didn't reply, just nodded his head. Taking the goods, he left the store while Jeremy watched him with a long, grim stare. Richard needed to stop by one more place. It was a small market where they sold organic food. They also sold chickens and their eggs. He walked among the cages and chose the biggest and fattest one. After making the purchases, he hurried home. His wayward son probably already awaited him. When he arrived home, he saw an unfamiliar jeep decorated with skulls and flames. Richard didn't like it. He entered the house and saw a stranger. It was a man in his thirties with long curly hair, dressed in colorful attire. From his appearance, it was clear that he was some kind of hippie, though Richard didn't know what they called such people these days. Who are you? he asked. But before the man could answer, his son rushed out from the next room saying, old man, where have you been? Then Richard asked Michael again, who is this? This is my buddy, Billy. He will help us with the filming. Don't worry, I've already settled with him about the share, his son replied. The old man grumbled, looking at the pair with dissatisfaction, and went to get ready. Going up to his bedroom, he opened the chest of drawers and pulled out his old ranger uniform, which he had kept all this time and which had already gathered dust. Shaking it, he put it on and looked at himself in the mirror. 
it still fit him well. Satisfied with what he saw, he adjusted the collar and went downstairs to continue getting ready. Soon he brought out two backpacks in which he put tents, sleeping bags, and other necessary items for the trip. He handed one to his son and took the other one himself, also slinging the rifle over his shoulder. Billy carried the filming equipment, a couple of cameras and some other device. Michael, seeing his father wearing it, said, What are you doing, old man? But then fell silent, understanding something. After that, Richard locked up Baxter at home, leaving him food and water for a couple of days. Going out into the yard, he pointed to the chicken coop, telling his son to take it. Michael was surprised and was about to ask why they needed it, but seeing that his father was already in a bad mood, he just picked it up. When they stepped outside, Michael thought they would go by car, but the old man headed towards the forest. Stopping at the edge, he turned to his son and said, Before we go any further, I have one condition. You'll give half of the money to your sister. As you say, I was planning to do that anyway, he replied. The old man nodded at that, and they continued their way. They slowly made their way through the dense forest, stepping on the soft ground strewn with pine needles and autumn leaves. Twigs sometimes crackled under their feet, and around them there was only the sound of nature, the rustle of leaves, the singing of birds, and the distant sounds of unknown animals that occasionally awakened in this dense world. They moved forward, relying on lightweight hiking poles, occasionally stopping to look around or catch their breath. Richard, despite his age, walked confidently and purposefully, leading them through thickets and avoiding fallen trees. He knew this forest like the back of his hand, having spent most of his life here. Michael, on the other hand, seemed less confident in this area, but still tried not to lag behind his father. His gaze constantly slid over the surrounding trees and bushes, searching for something unusual or threatening. Billy carried the camera on his shoulder, occasionally stopping to capture one or another landscape that caught his eye. His gaze was full of curiosity, but deep down he felt anxious as the purpose of their journey was far from ordinary. As they delved deeper into the forest, the surrounding nature gradually changed. The trees became older and denser, and the undergrowth thicker, creating the feeling that they were entering another world. The air was filled with the scent of damp earth and decaying leaves, enhancing the atmosphere of the unknown and mystical. Finally, they emerged into a small clearing, beyond which lay a low fence marking the boundary of the cemetery. It was an old Indian cemetery, forgotten and abandoned by time. Ancient tombstones and stone slabs with long faded inscriptions stretched along uneven rows, while wild flowers and shrubs grew between them. The place exuded a sense of peace, but at the same time sadness for the departed worlds. This was a landmark for Richard. They needed to go strictly north from here until they reached a small valley. They stopped for a small break taking out a couple of sandwiches from their bags, which Richard had prepared in advance. Chewing on the food, Michael asked his father what this place was. The old man didn't reply immediately, as if recalling something. Then he said that once there was a sanctuary here, belonging to one tribe. An Indian acquaintance of his told him about it. They worshipped a spirit here that ruled these lands, Every year offerings were made here, but over time, people started leaving, and the sanctuary was abandoned. And so, since there were no more offerings, the spirit could be angered. That's why his acquaintance asked him not to go to this area under any circumstances. But of course, Richard didn't listen to him. 
which almost ended in tragic consequences. Finishing their meal, the guys were ready to set off, but then the old man pulled out a huge dagger from his bag and menacingly approached Michael. Old man, what are you doing? He exclaimed in fear. But Richard kept moving towards him, saying nothing. When he reached his son, who recoiled in fright, the old man bypassed him and went to the chicken coop, opening it and pulling out a chicken. It started flapping its wings, trying to escape, but he held it firmly and carried it towards a small altar. Various symbols were carved on it, but the main one was a deer skull with horns. Holding the chicken by its legs, Richard made a swift stroke with the knife, causing blood to spill and its head flew off to the side. After it stopped moving, he laid it at the foot of the altar. The guys watched this scene, mouths agape. Meanwhile, the old man after this grabbed his belongings and headed further down the trail. The guys snapped out of their trance-like state and hurried after him. They continued through the dense forest until it gradually began to thin out. Soon the trees cleared and marshy terrain began. Frog croaks and insect chirps filled the air. Richard led the guys trying to stay on solid ground and avoid the bogs. As they passed by the water, they noticed a skeleton at the bottom. The water was crystal clear so they could see it in detail. Most likely the skeleton belonged to a deer. It was hard to tell for sure as its skull was missing. This was somewhat unsettling. Where had the head gone? After a brief pause and recording it on camera, the travelers moved on. Finally, the marsh ended and a slight ascent began. After that, they walked along a plateau covered with bushes until they reached the valley below, which was covered in dense forest, looking somewhat ominous. Suddenly, a flock of birds soared above it as if startled by something. Richard stopped and said that they would make camp for the night here. They set up their tents and lit a fire. It was starting to get dark, so they hurried to prepare dinner. After cutting up some meat, they cooked it in a pot, then added water and let it boil. After that, they added some vegetables and potatoes. The result was a kind of stew, which turned out surprisingly tasty. Billy remarked on it to which the old man said that food cooked over a fire always tastes better than stove cooked. When they finished eating, darkness had fallen, and Richard began to explain that tomorrow they faced a dangerous path, especially when they entered the forest located in the valley. Therefore, they needed to be extremely vigilant and cautious, as well as film everything, as the creature could appear at any moment. The guys silently nodded. They were scared. This place inspired some kind of horror. You couldn't feel it just by watching a video or hearing a story. You had to experience it on the spot, as if you were under the influence of some field. The trio continued to sit, discussing various things. Richard talked about his experience as a ranger, recalling the most vivid cases when suddenly a scream rang out from somewhere. It was a soul-piercing cry as if the victim had experienced unearthly horror. The guys jumped up and looked around, their faces reflected fear. They tried to determine the source of the sound, but darkness surrounded them. It was a new moon, so there was almost no light from the Earth's satellite. Suddenly, they heard another scream, this time from a different direction. What could it be? They turned to the old man, but he sat in the same position, quietly sipping tea, as if he hadn't heard anything. He asked the guys to sit down and calm down. They complied, albeit reluctantly, constantly looking around for danger. Richard explained that this was the harbinger of the Wendigo, and when travelers heard it, it meant they had to leave. These screams would sound all night, so he pulled earplugs out of his pocket and handed them to the guys. Putting a pair in his ears, he himself went into the tent. 
The guys were shocked by his composure, but it seemed that he had already experienced this and was handling it better than they were. Before lying down, they recorded on the camera. None of them could fall asleep. Terrifying screams echoed through the camp all night, interspersed with the old man's snores. In the morning, Richard emerged from the tent and saw the tired faces of his companions. They had dark circles under their eyes and disheveled hair. It was clear that they had tried to sleep but couldn't. The old man shook his head disapprovingly, but then remembered how he himself ended up here the first time. After that, he lit a fire and brewed coffee. Passing each of them a cup, he told them to prepare for the journey. They packed up their tents and cleaned up after themselves. Then Richard pulled a flamethrower out of one of the bags and handed it to his son. Showing him how it worked, he explained that he should use it when he said so. The son silently nodded, asking no questions. They left the bags at the camp, taking only the weapons and cameras with them. After that, they slowly made their way down. As they descended, Michael asked his father why he wasn't afraid. He remembered his face when he first told him about this place. And back then, the old man's face expressed horror. Now he was calm and collected. Richard replied that sometimes a man had to let go of fear for the sake of his family's survival. These words didn't sit well with his son. Something troubled him. Soon they reached the edge of the forest. Here, huge boulders lay as if the remnants of a once great wall. Approaching closer, they noticed strange symbols on them. Billy had already turned on the camera and was recording. Their path now lay through the forest. It seemed mysterious and eerie. It was unclear what created such an atmosphere. Perhaps the trees grew close to each other, or the fact that almost no other plants grew under them. Finally, as they entered, they headed deeper inside, constantly looking around. Everything was quiet for a while. They walked another half mile when suddenly they felt it getting colder. Michael felt himself freezing, but other than that, nothing else happened. Richard pondered. Could it be that he appeased the spirit and it didn't attack them? Then that was a problem because they needed recordings with it. Suddenly, he saw tracks on the ground. He leaned in closer to get a better look. The tracks were large, much larger than any human footprint, with long, elongated fingers ending in sharp claws. Richard frowned, trying to recall if he had ever seen anything like this in his many years as a ranger. But there was nothing similar in his memory. He followed the tracks, which went in a straight line through the forest floor, bypassing bushes and jumping over fallen trees. Every step the Wendigo left behind was clear and confident, as if the creature had no trouble moving in its natural environment. Suddenly the tracks abruptly ended at the edge of a small ravine. Richard looked around, searching for a continuation, but found nothing. It seemed the creature had silently leaped over the obstacle, leaving no sign of its presence on the other side. He looked at his son and his friend, contemplating whether to go further, when suddenly they heard noise behind them. They quickly turned around and prepared their weapons. Richard ordered Michael to hide behind a tree while he stood behind another, raising his gun. Meanwhile, Billy jumped into the bushes from where he was filming. They waited in suspense, expecting to see who would emerge from behind the trees. A shiver ran through them and sweat trickled down their faces when suddenly two people appeared before them. They were dressed in hunting suits and were carrying weapons. It was evident that it was a father and his son who was about 25 years old. Richard recognized the elder one. It was Jeremy, the owner of the hunting store. 
But what was he doing here? They saw that they had been discovered and raised their hands in a gesture of goodwill. Richard emerged from behind the tree and asked them what they were doing there. Sorry, old man, Jeremy replied. I figured you knew where to find this creature and couldn't miss this chance. We've been following you all this time and judging by these tracks, it seems it wasn't in vain. Let's be civilized. Whoever finds this creature first gets the reward. Bastard, Michael exclaimed, but Richard stopped him. Let them do what they want. This is not a place for arguments. What worried him more was the fact that they probably hadn't made offerings like he did, which could anger the spirit with their arrival. As if reading his thoughts, a strong wind blew. It was unnatural in such a dense forest. The wind was very cold. At first it was quiet and silent, but then it began to intensify and turned into a howl. Richard shouted for everyone to gather together and hide near the crown of a massive tree. It was difficult to do so. Nearby, near the roots of the adjacent tree, lay Jeremy and his son. The wind intensified, almost turning into a hurricane. The guys were afraid they would be swept away. Moreover, they began to feel cold, causing their teeth to chatter and steam started pouring out of their mouths. As soon as the wind subsided, pitch darkness fell around them, darker and denser than ever at night in the forest. It felt like they were blinded. The silence that followed the storm was so deafening that every rustle made their hearts skip a beat. Suddenly, whispers emanated from the depths of the forest, as if the wind continued to howl. But now, it sounded like words in an unknown language. The whisper quickly grew, taking on ominous tones, until it turned into a deep, rumbling voice that surrounded them from all sides. Richard and his companions huddled together, trying to find shelter in the embrace of the forest. Their breathing became heavy and erratic from fear. Then, unexpectedly for everyone, the darkness receded, and a figure appeared on the edge of the clearing. It was tall and emaciated, with long, sinewy arms ending in claws. Atop its head sat a deer skull with long, twisted antlers, which stood out against the darkness. The creature's eyes glowed red, piercing the darkness. The Wendigo stood motionless, observing them, and its breath was heavy and deep, filling the air with cold. The creature took a step forward and the earth beneath its feet rustled with dry leaves. Its movements were slow and deliberate, as if it were weighing each step. Suddenly it raised its hand towards them and in the air appeared a thin, almost invisible layer of frost which began to slowly descend to the ground, covering it with a white blanket. Richard felt the grip of his gun handle moistening in his hands. He turned and asked Billy if he had made the recording. Billy trembled and didn't answer immediately, so Richard had to shake him, which brought him to his senses. After that, Richard repeated his question, and Billy answered affirmatively. The deed was done, it was time to run. He shouted to his son and his friend to follow him, but then he saw Jeremy jump up, grabbing his weapon and head towards the creature. The old man yelled for him to run and not to do anything stupid, but the hunter didn't listen. Standing next to him, his son opened fire together with him. Loud shots echoed through the forest, deafening it, but the Wendigo kept standing, and then as if dissolving into thin air, appeared a few feet away from the hunter. Swinging with sharp claws, it cut his weapon in half, causing the father and son to recoil in fear. Richard shouted for them to run and didn't look back at them, rushing in the opposite direction. Two of his companions followed after him. As they ran, Richard felt the cold emanating from behind. Turning around, he saw everything around turning into an icy chill, and Jeremy and his son turning into pieces of ice. This sight shocked him. It was painful to see his old friend perish. 
he realized that the situation was much more dangerous than he had thought. Clearing his mind, Richard focused on escaping. They ran with all their might, trying not to look back. Suddenly, an impenetrable darkness fell again, and to his horror, he lost his companions. Turning on his flashlight, he found that the light seemed to be swallowed by the darkness, which plunged him into despair. So he wandered in the darkness, crying out and calling for his son, but no one answered. Suddenly, from somewhere to the side, he heard a painfully familiar voice that he hadn't heard in five years. This voice twisted his insides. He turned and saw his wife, Martha, standing literally ten feet away from him, warmly smiling, and then she called him to her. Richard's mind went blank. He missed his wife so much that he threw caution to the wind and quietly slowly walked towards her. With each step, she came closer so he could see the wrinkles on her face. It seemed that all troubles had left him, and he found himself in paradise. When he was just a couple of feet away from her, suddenly a bark sounded, which made him snap out of it. His wife's face turned into a terrible grimace, and she hissed. After that, the darkness dissipated and he saw his dog, Baxter. Tears streamed from Richard's eyes. He realized he had fallen into a trap, but it was difficult to break free from it. He sat down and petted his dog, thanking him for saving him. The dog just happily wagged his tail as if saying, What are you talking about, Master? He didn't have time to ponder how his dog ended up here. At that moment, memories of his son flared up in his mind with renewed strength, pushing him to search. The path was long and exhausting, but in the distance, the flickering of flames from a flamethrower caught his attention. With his heart racing, he headed towards the source of light. Approaching, he found his son alone amidst emptiness, seemingly struggling with an invisible enemy, turning around and shouting, continuously directing the stream of fire. In despair, Richard began to call him, trying to snap him out of it. For a while, the young man didn't react, but finally, his gaze cleared of fear at the sight of his father. Panic reflected in his eyes, seeing the destruction he caused. At that moment, the old man decisively took his son's hand, and together they hurriedly searched for Billy. Billy was quickly found out of habit he had hidden in the bushes. Reunited, they set off again, feeling the relentless pursuit at their heels. It seemed like darkness enveloped them, bringing with it a piercing cold. Looking back, Richard saw the silhouette of the monster behind them. This vision almost weakened him, but the old man found the strength to run as fast as his exhausted body could. It seemed like the cold began to recede, but a sudden cry from his son made his heart stop. Turning around, he saw his son fall into a small pit, from which it was difficult for him to escape. In the distance, he saw the figure of the Wendigo swiftly rushing towards them. Michael tried to climb out, calling for help. Father, help me! These words made Richard see not an adult son before him, but a little three-year-old boy whom he once loved to carry on his back. This boy, tearful and desperate, pleading for help, called to him. He remembered how he first held him in his arms when he was just a baby, how his wife whispered to him that he looked like an angel, how he first put him on a bicycle, how they spent time together at his job in the park. Then Richard made his final choice. Rushing to his son, he helped him out of the pit, snatching the flamethrower from his hands, and yelled at him to run. But his son couldn't believe his words. The old man grabbed him by the shoulders, looked into his eyes, and said, Run and live in a way that you won't be ashamed of later, 
and be sure to take care of your sister. Michael refused to leave him. Tears streamed down his face, but his father shouted again for him to run and he ran. Finally, Richard could breathe calmly. He grabbed the gun and opened fire, but it was futile. So he switched to the flamethrower. He waited for the creature to close the distance. Suddenly he felt something rubbing against his legs. He looked down and saw his dog. No, Baxter, go run, save yourself. But the dog didn't leave, just barked. Then turned around and snarled angrily at the approaching monster. When the creature was just a few feet away from him, he ignited the flamethrower and the stream of fire shot forward. There was a horrifying scream and an incredible coldness enveloped everything again, freezing everything around. It froze Richard, who stood unwavering, and his dog stood in a fighting stance next to him. The last light faded from the old man's eyes, ending his journey. The monster approached his head as if trying to peer into his soul. From the openings of its skull where its nose should have been, cold vapor burst out. Meanwhile, Michael and Billy ran out of the woods and headed back to their camp. Michael was engulfed in grief. There was no expression on his face. Gathering their belongings, they headed back home. They arrived by evening. To their surprise, Sarah was there. Apparently, she had released Baxter. Her face showed deep concern, and upon seeing her brother, she hurried towards him. He, lowering his head, didn't want to speak, but eventually he told her about what had happened. When he finished, there was a slap. It was Sarah slapping her brother, and in tears she went upstairs. Michael didn't react to this. He felt he deserved it and worse. Meanwhile, Billy called rescuers who headed to the scene but found no one there. However, the recording they made was made public and caused a stir. Money was raised and Michael handed part of it to Jeremy's family. He also helped his sister's husband. Finally, he had money, but having it didn't make him happy. This incident radically changed his life, and he tried to live in a way that wouldn't disgrace his father's name. Six months later, on a quiet winter morning, Sarah decided to visit her father's house. She never decided to sell it. Leaving her child with the nanny, she arrived at the place. The old house hadn't changed at all. Upon entering, she started cleaning. Wiping the floors and dusting the shelves, she noticed a photo album on top of the dresser. Opening it, Sarah discovered the chronology of their family's life. Memories flooded her and she burst into tears. But suddenly, from outside, she heard the barking of a dog and then the sound of the front door opening. Who could that be? She wiped her tears, put the album back in place, and headed for the exit. When she stepped into the hallway, she saw a person standing in the doorway, smiling warmly at her. Her legs lost their strength and she took a step back, saying, You? 